Hello, everyone. Welcome to our live stream. I have to click one more thing on the screen. We are going to show you how to spin a, an alpaca angora rabbit and sheep's wool roll leg blend that's been hand carded. We're going to show you how to do it with ease, and we're just going to have a little maybe quiet time, maybe a little chit chat. So, my tension is too high. We're just going to join on right away. This is a blend of hand carded alpaca, black alpaca, mokaya, a uh, from our fin sheep, the Ron, some of his wool, a beautiful brown, almost like a gray brown, and some tort angora. So we took about a third of an ounce of each and used our Howard hand carters. They're super fine. We've had them forever. They're very durable, last forever. I highly recommend them. And we hand carted the three fibers together. We got no real consistent, uh, consistent method. So we just loaded the hand carters. However, and then um, hand carded everything once together. That way it's not, the fibers were not super blended together. There's still some, there's some variety in your colors. So you can see some distinction between the Angora, between the sheep's wool, and between the alpaca. If we were to start hand carding them together more, uh, more passes. So if I if I put them through my hand carders maybe three times, uh, you might find you're going to start getting some of the fibers caught on the teeth, producing what's called naps. So instead of the fibers being straight, it gets bent and stuck around the tooth of the hand carder and produces a lump. Those are we call those naps, and that is a sign that you're carding, you're over carding, um, over carding the fibers. So, that was our preparation with this. We're spinning this quite fine. Um, ideally, you could, it's, uh, this is a fiber from our October Spinner Surprise Box. And you could, you get nailed three ounces total of this fiber for the month of October. This is October's fiber. And ideally, you'd make, you'd spin up three singles. Um, carding the wool as the fibers as I as I just explained, and then you would um, you would ply those together and create yourself a three ply of yarn, a beautiful three ply of yarn. And these colors are all natural; these haven't been dyed. These there's nothing um, there's nothing unnatural about these. They've been washed once, so. The sheep's wool, the fin, has been washed once. The alpaca has been washed once. But the angora has not been washed. The angora is, is natural raw to the rabbit. And that's usual, so usually something that I do. I'm not going to um, wash the angora first before carding it and spinning it. I usually just card and spin the angora raw, right off, just straight off the rabbit. Um, and that is, that's just a preference that I have because I find that it's just very easy to wash the angora in yarn form after it's been spun. That's the easiest for me. So that's what we're spinning. We're using the Ashford Elizabeth II spinning wheel. And this process is not a, uh, it's not a slow process. When you think about spinning 100% angora and hand carding 100% angora, that is going to take you a bit longer than, than working with this blend that we have here. This is the sheep's wool and the alpaca. The fibers are thicker. The individual fibers are thicker than the individual angora fibers. And so we can spin this thin, and it's not going to take us as long to spin this thin because of the thickness of the sheep and the alpaca fibers. So it just spins up a bit faster that way. So when I think of this, again, I, ideally, it, 
would, it would love to be a three ply yarn. But the truth is, you could just take the spinner surprise box, the fiber for October, and you could just hand cart however you want. You could do whatever you want with this. You could take this and um, do the, the sheep's wool separately, do the alpaca separately, do the angora separately, make three separate singles, and then put them all together. You could make one single of all of it and chain ply it. You could make one single of all of it and just ply it back on itself using the center pole ball method. You can, and then you just make a two ply skein of yarn. So, and I, I call them skeins, but the truth is they're called hanks when I when I take them off the window they're hanging. And I just never care to use the proper terminology, and I should. I don't know why I should. I don't know why I said that. Maybe I shouldn't care. Maybe it doesn't matter. But maybe it's one of those things that who cares? Who cares what you're calling it. But I guess if you're trying to communicate accurately with somebody and trying to share an idea, it does matter when you use some words. So. Anyways. So the way this is going is I'm spinning this up and I'm getting some sections of all three fibers together in this twist, some sections primarily just of one or two. So it's, it's really cool. And this to me, this really reminds me of the frost in the end of autumn that you start seeing on the ground and like, you know, a garden that's been cleared away with some leaves on the dirt in the garden and a little bit of frost. That's really when I think of this yarn. It just, it tells you it's, it's autumn. It tells you it's fall. And that's what it, it really has to say. That's what it wants to represent. So yes, if you're interested in this fiber, you just go to rabbitreeandyarns.com and click on Spinner's Surprise. And that's where you find this, this fiber combination. So some of this, there's uh, pieces of vegetable, vegetable matter, and matter still in there. When you're hand carding, some of the vegetable matter falls out onto the floor. When you're spinning, more of the vegetable matter falls out onto the floor. When you wash it, you know, or what, you, know, you, you pick out some of it if they're bigger sections. When you wash it, more comes out of your yarn. And then, you know, finally, when you use it, if there's anything that's been twisted up in the yard that you just missed, you can pick it up then. And you, you know, through that process, I find my yarn ends up just very natural. Ever so often, you may get a little piece of vegetable matter stuck in your yarn, and in the end, that's okay. Normally, it's dried up and crumply, and you can even kind of go like this to the yarn. And the crumpled up piece of vegetable matter just breaks into pieces and falls out. So it's just a very easy way of handling getting vegetable matter out. Now super saturated uh, fibers, super saturated wools, this, that, that's going to take a little bit more effort than, than what I just described. You're going to pick out a few more pieces here and there. But, you know, that's okay. It's part of the process of just enjoying this. So you hear the bumping of my spinning wheel because of the, I actually have two knots in my dry band. Um, our cat chewed my dry band. And so to repair it, I quickly added some more sections on to make it now long enough again that it would reach and go all the way around. And um, in the process, I've got, I've got some very bumpy knots in my drive van. So when it goes through, it creates that, it creates that noise for now until, um, until I tighten down and smooth down those knots. And part of it is, uh, it's just the wheel. That's just, I use a natural hemp drive band. Oh, I very much like this. This is going to be very pretty. I use a natural hemp dry band, and so it does have to be, the hemp does have to be joined together 
to obviously create the loop to, to make a dry pan down here. Which they have is very durable, but it's not durable enough to withstand a cat attack. It's not durable at all for that. It succumbs immediately. So if you wanted to watch this, how we actually prepared this fiber on our members only section in the library of videos, we did a live video this morning of how to actually prepare this fiber, all the hand carving. And then that's where I gave, if you're interested in a bit more information on what is going on in this rabbit tree and what's going on at the rabbit tree yard, some of the behind the scenes information, that's where you find that information when you join uh, the members the membership section. But that's not, you know, that you're not obligated to do that by any means. Um, it's something that if it's if you're interested in that sort of thing, like how on earth do you do this and, and what is this, all that good stuff, then that's where that's where you can find it. This little section right here is a little bump that I need to take out. And then I just rejoin on. There's a lot of different ways to join yarn. And what's the best way to join yarn? A way that it a way that it stays. A way that it doesn't break when the join has when the join has integrity and it creates a strong yarn. That's that's your best way. And you'll find over experience and you'll find over time when you're spinning different yarns more easily or more uh, more difficult are more difficult to join. And Angora is one that can feel slippery. If you spin it in a certain way, sometimes it might not want to join. And you really have to be careful of your joints. Otherwise, when you're you're going back on that single and you're plying it, or even if you're spinning it as a single to use, you might not have the strength or the integrity in the yarn. So you can hold it at a 45 degree angle, the, the uh, wool to join. You can hold it at a 90. Uh, you can lay it flat on. With Angora, I found laying the Angora flat on your single is um, not the best way because Angora just does not have the sort of grip that, for example, this, this spin sheet does. It doesn't want to join like that. If you do that, the single really needs to have a lot of uh, openness to it, a sleek nice and compactly spun single, for example, may not, you know, a Bangora may not really want to join, in fact, does not really want to join this. There's not enough um, sticking out for those new fibers to join on to. But something I've been thinking a lot about recently is it's a, it's a concept that really was covered in detail in the book, Grit. Um, I forget. Buxworth wrote it, and just this idea of having grit, so basically keeping on, progressing, keeping on the same path, working towards something, not giving up, uh, attempting to achieve proficiency and mastery, and I've been thinking a lot about my spinning of 100% Angora. So if you're a hand spinner and you think, if you spin yarn and you think of your skills, your proficiency, your ability, your skill level of, of spinning, one of the things that, I read that book many years ago, but one of the things that's covered in detail is the idea of it takes 10,000 hours of doing something to get very well at it, to become a master of it, highly proficient. And you know, I think about my spinning and sometimes I'll sit and I'll calculate, uh, calculate the hours I have in for the spinning. And it's, spinning is such a personal thing. I mean, you can do it in groups. That's wonderfully fun. But it's also such, such personal because your yarn, it all tells the truth. The yarn you spin 
can't help but, but say the truth of what it is. So you can't help but tell you the truth of the animal that it came from. Excuse me. Is the animal healthy? Is this a beautiful fiber from the animal, or, or is the animal kept in poor conditions and the animal sick and produces a fiber that breaks? And so the fiber tells you tells you a lot. And how it's spun tells you a lot. How is it prepared? And did somebody take the time to to get all the vegetable matter out as best as they could? Did somebody take the time to uh, cart it if necessary properly? You know, the yarn speaks to you, and at every level, it shares these secrets of of what it is. Because you know, this is not fake yarn. This is real yarn. This is not. This is not made of plastic, which is a beautiful thing because you touch this yarn, you touch any real wool yarn, any real alpaca, any real angora rabbit, any real sheep's wool or um, angora from a goat, which is not called angora, it's called mohair, or cashmere, which is also from a goat. And anytime you, you have these fibers, you could have from a from a yak you can have um, fiber and anytime you have these these real fibers and you touch this real yarn this is not there's nothing the same there's nothing similar between real yarn and yarn uh, that's just made of plastic and called yarn but it's not yarn. that's not real it's, it's a chemical that uh, it has no story to tell you. It has no truth to speak to you. It's there to take your money and to make itself experience a benefit, but it's not there to benefit you. Which is my own personal belief. That you, don't, you don't have to agree with that or not. Yet. Again, the experience of when you know the rat that this fiber comes from, or you know the animal the fiber comes from, or you uh, you have a story behind it, you know the personality, you know, especially if it's an animal you own, like an Angora rabbit that you own, and you have taken care of it, you have spent time with it, you have learned everything you needed to know to keep it happy and healthy and to produce good wool for you and you know you live your life with this animal and it and angora rabbits they cannot be left unshorn and they cannot be left they are not a rabbit that came from the wild they are a man-made creation and so therefore man because man has created it humans i say man and i mean humans humans have created it we have an obligation to this animal that we have created because we've made something that cannot exist on its own in nature and a more rabbit cannot. Um, its wool would just keep growing, it would mat to the body, it would trap all sorts of debris, um, it would be inhumane, it, especially to release like a angora rabbit into the wild. Um, not a good thing to do if you're not giving it a life at all. So the you know the creation of this angora rabbit, being able to to raise it, to care for it, to do good by it, and to get the, to get the joy of having the wool from it, and to create things from that wool, and to know it came from your friend. Uh, and, you know you have a life with your friend. It's really a beautiful thing, and that that to me is. That to me is real. I did a magazine article interview recently, and uh, that's something that that I discussed briefly, or maybe in depth. I don't know how long it was in the end, but just that which is real. There's a difference between a real hat, a real winter hat, a fake winter hat. There's a difference between a real winter hat that you know is um, lovingly, humanely, intelligently made and crafted and from animals that are cared for 
and that this hat will keep you warm. It, that's, there's, there's no absence of truth in that. It's only 100% true. And I think about um, often living simply and simplifying life. And I think about this complex world. And recently I was talking with one of my, one of my friends who's a crocheter just about the complexity, how life is the way it is right now with just so many different responsibilities, so many different obligations, so many different choices. Life seems to be going quite fast. And just remembering to have a choice. Just because that's the flow of life right now, and much of much of people maybe around you live at a fast pace, and that doesn't mean you must be. Sometimes it's easy to be swept away in it all, but yet you always have the ability to get over that current. You don't. If you're swept away by the current, you can always just put your feet down, and you will touch ground, and you can stop. You can stand up. And instead of just being swept away by the current, you can stand and you can see clearly and look around you and decide for yourself where it is that you want to go. Do you want to keep going where the current is? Fine, then go. But if you want to stop and if you want to have peace and if you want to have solace, if you want to experience the satisfaction and contentment, well, just put your feet down. Stand up. And that's part of what this fiber is, it's just real. And this entire process. Oftentimes, if I'm publicly at an event spinning fiber, people are amazed. Uh, a fiber can come from a rabbit? And then, of course, there's usually questions I have a dog, I have a cat. Well, yes, you know, many longer haired dog furs and longer haired cat furs, yes. Uh, yes, you can spin that up. And it's funny to watch people as they learn this. It's, it's not funny in a like in a way where you laugh at somebody, but in a way where um, honest realization and you watch on the person's face where they realize, wow, I didn't know. Especially in such a fast-paced world, when you, if you seek peace, if, if you seek a moment where maybe you have to be in the current, you know, maybe you have to be where you're at in life. Maybe you have to work hard all the time. Uh, maybe it's a job you just do not like. Maybe it does not speak to your soul. Maybe you disagree even. There's a part of you maybe that disagrees with with your job, but you, it's what's providing for you and providing maybe for your family. Maybe you have to. That's what it feels like. It's, you know, you can still find these, you can still find these moments. They are here for you, and, and something like this, of just sitting down and doing something that's very real. You know, nobody else. When you have this skill, the skill of creating your own yarn, that's what you can do with it becomes infinite, and then nobody can take that away from you. That ability to provide for yourself, nobody can take that away from you because what that means is. Just when you couple that with either the skills of weaving, knitting, crocheting, uh, felting, just simply um, and sewing, nobody, once you have this, you can make anything. If you want a blanket, you can just make it yourself. You're not obligated to, uh, to go searching, searching, searching to find that blanket that you want. You can simply say, I know the blanket that I want, and I'm going to make it. It's, it's really a beautiful thing to be able to be sufficient like that because if you think about it, how much of life depends just upon everyone else and everything else, and how much of your life really, like what you acquire, depends upon your own skills. And maybe for some of you, you can pertain to many skills and you have many skills and you can provide significantly for yourself. Yet in our modern world, that's not encouraged. It's not encouraged to be able to provide for yourself. It's not encouraged to be able to develop the skills besides go to your job, do your job, make money for somebody else. 
Well, what about what about the abilities that can never be taken away from you? That that when you have them, they are yours. That skill to if I want a pair of socks, I can just simply make myself a pair of socks. If I want a scarf, I can make myself a scarf. If I want a hat, if I want a sweater, if I want a blanket, if I want a pillow, if I want a toy, I can make any of this. And the yarn is, is what makes it possible. This simple skill of just being able to create this. And there's an independence in it, and there's a freedom of it, and then you begin to feel more human. And I think part of that is what maybe we lost in life. When we rely on everybody else, isn't that the same as being a child? And aren't we adults? Well, why, why would we allow our humanity to be taken from us like that? Right? To be allowed to be stunted? And told, no, you must not. Well, if you want to, that's fine. There's a difference between a butt so that until you want great. But if there's a piece of you that always says, God, it feels like something's missing, and you're always trying to, you're always trying the next thing, you're always searching, always, always trying to find the next thing to make you feel full, always trying the next thing to make you feel whole. I encourage you to try this. Try knitting, try crocheting, try weaving, try spinning. If you have the time and ability. Try raising an angora rabbit, learning how to give it a haircut, learning how to uh, to go through the entire process. It's not as difficult as you might imagine. And for those of you who are listening, who already do that, you know what I'm talking about. And we're, it's a brilliant life to be able to, to do that. It's a brilliant piece of life to have that. Whoops. I just let it break uh, in a primarily sheep school section. So even after years upon years of spinning, the yarn still can break. So again, I'm spinning this quite thin. And that's a wonderful thing. Uh, this would make a beautiful three-ply. But that's what we're going to be doing. That's what we're going to be doing today. We're actually waiting on a phone call or a text message. We're hoping for some interesting news about our Enagora Rabbit. We're waiting on some people. And we're just going to spin yarn. We're going to spin this yarn. I don't know what number of rolling I'm on. If you've been paying attention, I, I lost count. I think this might be only number one or two. I don't really know. This is only number one. And I'm sitting kind of slow. But that's probably because I'm talking to you. Which there's always so much to share. It's been a while, there's always so much to share in these spinning chats. For a long time, I have not spun up a single ply of yarn that I have wanted to use. I have been concentrating on um, three plies. Ooh. Every time I stop and I look at the bobbin, it looks it looks very beautiful. And then I think when I look at the yarn, I think, well, what do you want to be? What is it you want to be? And then. This yarn, this would be a brilliant pair of socks. Just the black, the brown, and this off-white, this tart angora color. It would just be a brilliant pair of socks. The sheep's wool, the fin, will add enough durability to this yarn, certainly to um, give some elasticity in there. That sheep's wool would do brilliant for that. But I dislike making socks. I dislike knitting socks. And if I did turn this single, if I only spun this 
this ounce, um, it wouldn't be enough for two pairs of socks, so I'd have to spin a bit more. But if I did spin this only, uh, and I, I wanted to make a teeny pair of socks, like maybe for a baby, the recommendation, even though babies don't walk on their feet, like a toddler, for example, if I wanted to make a pair of socks with this for a toddler, I would, if I only have this, I would want this to be a three, a three ply yarn uh, for more strength, thickness, and I would uh, have to chain ply it. And chain plying is something that traditionally was called Navajo plying. So, uh, so it's just called by different names, but the the process is the same of how you do it. It's, it's a way that you can take, and I have a video on that, but it's a way that you can take a single of yarn and turn it into a three ply of yarn without having to cut the yarn, um, without having to cut the single or anything like that. It's, it's a way that you can quite easily do that. But part of me thinks, you know, this is beautiful for socks because just simply the color, the color combination for a nice, a nice fall pair of socks, early winter pair of socks, just really brilliant. I'm also kind of tempted though just to leave this as the single and simply uh, wind it up into a ball using my ball winder and make a two ply out of this. But then that's going to leave me with a, a more thin, more fine yarn. And so then the question is with approximately one ounce, many, many yards, because this will probably be over, this is going to be over 300 and. Um, let me think. Oh, it'll probably be approximately 300 yards, is my guess. If I keep spinning it this thin and only apply it back on itself, it'll be somewhere around, maybe 280 is, is pretty reasonable for how many yards this would end up being. And then you think about, well, what would you, what can you do with 280 yards in an ounce of yarn? Well, many, many, many things. This would be also a beautiful yarn if you wanted to combine it with, use a, a two strand yeah, um, method of holding two strands of yarn and knitting to make something. So you'd hold this in your hand if you're knitting and hold something else in a different yarn in your hand. And then you can make a, a wonderful um, Anything when you hold it, you can make it something that's thicker because you're holding two strands held together. You can hold as many strands of yarn together as you can manage, actually. It doesn't just have to be two. But when I think about this, that's part of what my part of what my mind goes to is looking at it and thinking, what do you want to be? What do you want to be made into? And sometimes sometimes I can't find an answer to that, and all I do is I, I wait. And I just keep making yarn. And sometimes another yarn comes along, and another yarn comes along, and together uh, they become a hat. Or together they become a scarf. Or together, you know, it's the answer isn't there. And then I just don't force it. I don't, I don't push it. I wait. Wait till it tells me what what it wants to be. So really, what I guess I'm trying to tell you is I talk to yarn. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Just talking, just talking with some yarn. Oop, got a little thing here. So I hold that base of this and I join it farther up top a little bit before it starts getting thin. And I keep the base spinning and I just join back on. I'm getting thin again. See i got to pay attention to what I'm doing here. There we go. That is better. A little lump in there, but we're going to leave it. I like, so one of the things I really enjoy about hand spun yarn is no matter how 
perfect. I try to get it. I constantly find something. You know, there's always something in it. And it adds a little a little variety where maybe it's a slightly slightly thinner section, a slightly thicker section. And then when you're knitting with it, even the simplest of stitches, the simplest of patterns, because of that, that slight variation, it creates something just naturally beautiful. And it's like when you go outside and you look at a tree, and you put the bark of the tree, the bark is not the same pattern repeating over and over and over again perfectly. There's variety in it, there's variation in it. Even if you were to look at a cut log and you were to count the rings to see how old the tree is, you see variation in the rings. You actually take a look and you see, well, one ring isn't perfectly round and none of the rings are perfectly round. You may find all sorts of variation, but in it, it's beautiful. That's part of what makes it absolutely beautiful. It's real, and that's, that's part of why, of course, we get back to the concept of what's real, which really, it should be no surprise that that concept of what is real is a concept found in one of my favorite stories, and that's the Velveteen Rabbit. And of course, you know, that's the story of the child's toy. And the, the rabbit sees other rabbits and wants to know, uh, how, do I, how do I become real? What is this becoming real business? And it's this little rabbit's journey of, of that, finding the answer to that question and understanding the answer to that question. It's always been impactful because I don't know why. Maybe maybe you will understand this, but I've always been very aware in life of what is real and what is not. That that which has meaning and that which that which does not, that, that which someone's making you try to believe has meaning. And it's a concept I it's a concept I talked about in the members only video of hand carving this this morning earlier. Like, uh, just kind of going down that path of living a life living a life in which things that may matter to you. And this strange time in life where like sales are this is like a huge thing. In, in life, trying to sell somebody something. And I talk, you know, on a personal, I talk personally on a personal level just about my own business and my journey through that and managing that and where I'm at in the process of, you know, just this tremendous, there can be this tremendous pressure to operate your business in a particular way and to achieve metrics in a particular way in life, in anything in life, really. You know, achievement of these um, figures, perhaps, like monetary achievement is a big one. But then part of it is, does that, you know, is that real to you? Like how much of that is life? How much of that is just showing up for somebody else? Or, you know, what... Is that what you want in life? Is it always about the dollar? Maybe for some people it is, and that's fine. If you know that, that's that's your thing. But maybe maybe there's a piece of you that says, what is this? What is this? This is life? This, uh, this is what I was put here to do, to achieve, to make money for somebody else, and spend my life making money for somebody else, and scraping and you know, struggling while somebody else is profiting, maybe you question that. I don't know. It's a strange world. It's just a really strange world we're living in. And I often think it doesn't have to be. But that's easier said than done, which that goes back to my conversation with my crocheting friend about simple living. But what's really cool is I know there's a huge amount of people who want that. There's a huge amount of people out there who are saying, wait a minute, enough. Enough people. I want my life to be my own. You don't get my life. You don't get my time. This is mine. And I get to tell you 
when I give it or not. There's a lot of people who are interested in, in that sort of freedom. I talked to my husband walking last night, just probably talked about living simply and about the need for bravery in these times, to be brave about it. Because in some ways it goes against the consumerism piece of this world. And much is based off that. Not that, you know, not that I'm certainly not saying buying things is bad. I, I very much appreciate that the internet allows, um, I live in a rural area, and the, the internet allows me access to things that otherwise I would not have access to. And that's something in some ways to be grateful for. So such a balance. So who has found that balance? Who out there who's listening has found that balance? Who has the answers? But then that question is silly because you're never going to have the answers for me. You're only going to have the answers for you in your life. Because your life is not my life. My life is not your life. And my daily day-to-days are certainly different. Some similarities, of course. Which reminds me of rabbits. Because, you know, a lot of things remind me of rabbits. But I always find it interesting. Um, each rabbit has its own personality, just like humans. Each human is different. Just because one human uh, is one way doesn't mean all humans who are that way are that way. And so it's the same with, you know, same with animals. Each animal has its own little personality. Each rabbit, each of these Angora rabbits has its own personality. Each of my sheep, they all have their own, uh, their own personalities, their own ways about things. And it changes over time. Like when Arthur was a young, he was a young rabbit, a young buck, which is what male rabbits are called. He he was always a dignified rabbit, but he was certainly goofy. But as he ages, his goofiness has quieted down, and his dignity is just simply there. Not all rabbits. Not all rabbits carry themselves with dignity. Some rabbits are just complete in other clowns. As it is with humans. My roll eggs are on the floor in a lump. As you can see, sometimes I have teeny lumps, you probably cannot see the cameras too far away, but I have teeny lumps that are in this. And I just let those lumps be sometimes. And sometimes I pick them out. Sometimes I take out the piece that might cause a lump. So this isn't going to be certainly not a bumpy, bumpy eye. This is, we're hoping to have it quite smooth with only slight areas of interest that come along. Just enough to tell you that it's, uh, it's there. So two days ago, it was over 80 degrees here, and today, uh, it isn't supposed to be that warm at all. And when you have, when you raise animals such as rabbits for their wool, part one of the things you have to manage is the climate that they're in, because Angora, the fiber that the rabbit grows, it's warm. It's very warm fiber. It's insulating, even in summertime. Even though the angora rabbit is is not going to produce as much angora fiber on their body as they will in wintertime, it's still insulating, and it's still something to manage. And one of the things I've been very, very hard, uh, I've been working on very hard, is to have and produce an angora rabbit that handles the extremes of summertime and wintertime. And here, the weather gets really goofy sometimes. Like, uh, it was over 80 degrees 
And then recently, last night, it, it got down quite quite a bit more chilly, over 30 degree difference. Well, a 30 degree difference in a couple of days to a rabbit uh, is significant. And so managing managing this, um, you know, it takes time and it, it takes a little bit of effort. But if you start with rabbits that are naturally able to better handle this, if you keep selecting rabbits um, when you're breeding them that are better able to handle this, you end up with a rabbit that is more durable. And temperatures have been kind of weird. But they've been getting quite strange, you know, the past however many years. But there's a second cut, a second cut of alpaca. So a second cut is when someone's shorn roll off and then they go over the section that's still over uh, either the bottom but still attached to the rabbit and they cut a little bit more off and they end up with a, a short section of wool that creates a clump. And normally you can just pick those out, you can just shake those out. Sometimes they may get stuck in your single, at which point you have to kind of use your use your finger your fingers, your fingernails to kind of pry it out between the fibers that you accidentally spun it up into. What happens is those seconds shed, by the way. And that they're okay. They can, you know, they can provide some variety in the novelty yard. That's okay, and, but they will end up shedding small fibers, so they won't, they will not, because they're so short, they will not remain intact. But yes, producing rabbits that can withstand, that are more durable, that are healthier rabbits. Also, something that was important to me, this is kind of a, on that same topic, but kind of off to the side, is one of the things that was very distressing was hearing people who would have a rabbit and if they fed their rabbit anything natural, like grass, dandelions, lettuce, um, carrots, the rabbit would become, some people's rabbits would become sick and their digestive system was so unable to handle the introduction of a new food, not, not something a rabbit isn't made to eat, but something that a rabbit is made to eat and the rabbit itself couldn't tolerate it. To me, it was distressing because it was like, what's going on with these rabbits? Why, why do we have rabbits that just are not able to handle things that they should naturally be able to eat? Rabbits, rabbits naturally in the wild eat a variety of things. That's just what they do. And it was distressing to hear rabbits in captivity, rabbits that were owned by humans, where the rabbits were struggling to have um, a variety in their diet. And so it became important to me, this is the second cut right here. Um, it became important to me to make sure that the rabbits that I was producing could handle a variety and not have to have rabbits that you are, uh, Sore, that you have to be so cautious of what you feed them that the rabbits themselves are so sickly that you must be cautious of what you feed them. I had no intention of uh, continuing on any of that. And so, um, you know, you often hear people who are like, oh, if you're going to feed your rabbits something, you're going to do it in small amounts at first. And I wanted to be able to get back to the point where natural rabbits in the wild are, where they come across, maybe they're hopping around in their territory and they come across you know, a whole bunch of new plants and they eat it. And they are not, it's not something that causes harm to them. And I found that it's not difficult. That's not a difficult thing. So we often rely as, as rabbit raisers on pelleted feet. And if that's all you have, and if that's all you have access to, the pelleted food will keep your rabbit alive. You can do that. Yet, that's, um, if you could do more, that's better for, you, for your rabbit. So if you could add hay in there, that's certainly better for your rabbit. So pelleted feed, it, it was marketed like the end-all, be-all at first, just like 
you know, in the beginning, you would beg to keep the dog food, you beg to cat food. That's all you need. It's the complete meal. And yet, uh, we know now that, no, that, that's just a part of what would keep a dog healthy. That's just a part. And in fact, dogs find it terribly dull just to eat um, one big dog food the rest of their life. So it's like a human. How would you like to eat one bag of uh, like ramen noodles the rest of your life and then expect to be healthy or something? Like we have ramen noodles and a multivitamin. Try to live off that. I don't know. Maybe maybe you can, but I don't think this is going to be the best for a human being. But it's the same with rabbits, where yes, we can we can. It is allowable to if that's all you can do, if that's all you have access to, and that's what you feed your rabbit, yes, the rabbit will live, and you can do that. But yet, for the healthiest, um, happiest rabbits, I found they just were really content nibbling around on all sorts of things. So one of the things our rabbits have a lot of access to right now, and have for a long time, is we grow sunflower plants. And the rabbits have access to those sunflower leaves, and they love them. And they have access to apples, and apple sticks, um, all year round. You can just go out into the orchard and take some, you know, cut some apple sticks. Even in winter time, you can. You're not going to kill your tree by cutting a couple apple sticks off, and you can give those to my rabbits, and they love it. And it doesn't cause any digestive distress for them. And again, that's, you know, that's not their primary feed. We're not only feeding them apple sticks. But we can give them a variety, and we can give them uh, kitchen scraps. Like, you know, if we give them carrot peels, perfect. If we give them celery, parts of celery, no problem. Uh, there's, there's a lot you can do for your rabbits. And it's very efficient as well for handling, like, the food, the leftover food scraps, and even leftover food. like. If you cook carrots, if you, have, if you make cooked carrots one night, you make a lot of cooked carrots, and you have you cook them in olive oil, for example, and you could you, if you can't eat them all and they're you know, you're not going to be able to eat them in the future, you can certainly feed them to your rabbits. To your rabbits like that. As long as they're healthy rabbits, I should say my rabbits should eat that. I don't know about your rabbits, but in some rabbits, this is what's crazy. They have their own have their own, their own preferences for food. So some rabbits want, they like carrots. Some rabbits don't care. That's not something. Like I have one rabbit that, you know what? You can put a zucchini in his cage. He's not going to eat it. That's Jeffrey. Jeffrey is not going to eat a zucchini. He just doesn't want to. He's, you can see he may try a nibble on it. But then he just hits on his preference. So I have one, two, I have five row legs left besides this one. Recently, at night, we're reading the book Heidi Aloud, very old book, and I've never in my life read it before. I've never even fully watched the movie. So, that's something new and definitely reminds me of Simple Living. It's based in the late 1800s, I believe. So, definitely a different way of life not the same as what we have now where we have YouTube and everything is at our fingertips. Anything we could possibly need or want is, is certainly at this point now just a click away. So very different, very different time period. A very interesting book. I have a little bit here, a pin sheet that's going to give 
small. So the fibers of this, there's a section I've got, I've come to in this row light where there's a lot of, of thin sheet and it's the brown and it's not fully carded out. So if I just use my fingers on my right hand, I can pull out and just kind of stretch it out a little bit and that'll help it be uh, spun nicely into this without having lots of bumps in it. Which is what we want. We don't want a ton of bumps in this yet. We want a traditional, more traditional, thin, fine uh, yarn of this. Getting near the end of this rollet. We're, we are going to wash this yarn when we're done spinning, once we're done flying this, turning it into its final final ply. Which again, I don't know if I'm going to do a two ply or a three ply. I do not. Because as I'm spinning this, I don't know with this particular single, I don't know yet what I'm going to do. Sometimes I have it planned out. Typically with 100% uh, Angora, I spin uh, three one ounce approximately one ounce singles and then ply them all back together to get a beautiful consistent free ply of yarn. But in the book Heidi, uh, there's a lady, there's an older woman, her name is Grandmother, and she uh, she sits at her spinning wheel in the book and she spins, she's blind. And she just spins and spins and spins. Spins yarn. And of course, those of us who've been doing this for a while, at some point, you know, we can just sit and just, we can do something else. We can watch a movie, we can talk with others. We don't have to be staring down at our, our yarn after we've done this for a while. That just broke because it's a bad joint. which I appreciate when the bad joints are so bad that they break, because then I can do it correctly, do it well, have a second chance at doing it and making it right. It just joined on a bit thin on the first preliminary fibers to join on to the single, and it wasn't gonna hold. So usually when I spin, um, even though I'm looking down, I'm not, I, I don't know how to say this, I'm not necessarily fully looking at, at this spider, even though maybe I have my head down. I see it, and it, it's strange. So part of me, I see this fiber, I see what I'm doing, I see what's going on, but I'm not 100% focused on it. It's not, my attention can be elsewhere as well, and I can, just, I can still spin. And of course, when I say that, you know, there's no such thing as multitasking. The brain only can focus on one thing at a time, and it switches very quickly from one to the other. That's what we call multitasking. And uh, I guess part of spinning is it's just very relaxing. That's part of just what happens is I just simply become very, very, very relaxed. And it's a very repetitive, obviously a very repetitive motion. I just repeat and repeat and repeat and it's just something that's very calming. And sometimes I find it hard, even in doing like video like this right now, I find it difficult to continue talking because really my what I want to do is to just quietly sit here. Because when I'm not making a video, that is what I'm doing. I'm just simply, you know, I'm just simply sitting here, spinning yarn, and, and thinking. Maybe I'm thinking about something often, but maybe I'm just spinning, and that's all I'm doing. And my mind can be at rest. Because I think there's a lot of times 
My mind is not at rest. I don't know about your mind. But it's hard to, to get rid of that monkey brain that jumps all over the place and is unruly. It must have, must be here, must be there, it must have this topic, that topic. It must constantly find something, it must produce spots to get rid of that and to have quiet. I need to change this. Nope, I did already. Good. I have to double check. Which is, you know, we watch the other videos. I'm terrible at changing my graphs. Changing my uh, yarn on the hooks. Changing it to a different hook so it loads the bottom nice and evenly. But I'm getting better. I watched, I think, a while back one of my older videos and it was very terrible. There would be a huge section of the bobbin just completely full of, of what was spun. Perhaps it's all part of that 10,000 hour thing I started talking about and never, never really finished. When you're spinning, you can feel the difference between the fibers. I feel, and I know that this is Angora, and this to me is the most enjoyable out of all of these to spin. This is Angora. My foot's falling asleep, so that's why I'm not. Uh, Changing the leg in which I trade a little. I was just falling asleep because I was I have my legs crossed. That's all. Which is something I, I don't know why I do it, but I never started out doing this. I don't know. Does anyone else do that? I'd be interested just to know. When I first started out, I actually had a double trade on. Ashford Kiwi, the original Kiwi, not a Kiwi 2, not a Kiwi 3, the original Kiwi. And his name was Bob. Bob still exists. He was a wonderful spinning wheel. And in the end, um, I could not. I became more advanced for Bob. So I could not produce the yarn as quickly that I wanted to produce on Bob as I can on this spinning wheel here. And I've talked a lot about this, and people have different ideas about this, but the tools you use, they do have influence over the yarn you make. And you can do that. You can do things to compensate for your tools. But as far as producing uh, thin, fine, consistent, traditional yarn, that's what this wheel was made for. That's what the Ashford Elizabeth II was made for. And this is actually a discontinued uh, wheel, I believe, now. So, unfortunately, this is a wonderful, wonderful wheel. If you can get your hands on one of these, that's something special. It's it's very much, uh, it's, it's more finicky than the Ashford Kiwi. The Ashford Kiwi is a wonderful beginner wheel. Highly recommend that for it as a beginner wheel. It's much more portable than, than this wheel. You can you can just really do a lot with an Ashford Kiwi. And it's certainly much more, uh, it's a lower price point than the Ashford Elizabeth II was. So you could, you know, you could get the uh, Kiwi. You could get it somewhere near uh, half the price of what you pay for the Elizabeth II. And the Ashford Kiwi is a great all-around wheel that whatever you ask it to do, it's the little wheel that says okay. Whereas this one, sometimes it rebels and it does not say okay. It says no, that's not what I'm going to do. That's not what I'm made for. Something as simple as having a bigger wheel, the bigger flywheel. If you guys have watched my other videos, you know what I'm going to say. It makes, helps make this traditional yarn more consistent because that big wheel is a nice consistency going around. Whereas, um, you know, that puts a good consistent twist in your yarn and it makes 
It may make trailing a little bit different on the asteroid the Elizabeth II than the Kiwi, certainly, because well, you can set up you can set up an Elizabeth II as a double trail, but uh, mine is set up as a single trail right now, and that's part of also what's different. But you know, you can set things up and you can change things and, and do different things. But in the end, uh, you know, this wheel is is made for producing the yarn I'm producing right now. That's what this that's what this wheel excels at. And there's some wheels that are made to make art yarns, like the Ashford Country Spinner. It's made to make art yarns, bulky, big, interesting art yarns. And that's not what this wheel at all is made for. This wheel struggles because of the hooks. It is not um, it is not ideally set up for really bulky types of art yarns. You can make an art yarn on this wheel. I have made art yarns on this wheel. You can make it. It just it's going to require managing uh, managing the yarn, and there's only a, there's only such a thickness that will go through the orifice of this, uh, and then it will simply be unable to fit. If you have if you're trying to produce too big of a yarn, this is not this is not the wheel for it. And of course, you know there's there's all sorts of adjustments you can do and you can you can try all sorts of different things to try to get away with you know producing things. Yet I find um, I find this is absolutely perfect for this sort of yarn this wheel. It just makes it helps make the yarn more beautiful. And there's a learning curve with every wheel you have. You learn the wheel. You learn together with the wheel you make the yarn. Sometimes um, people will ask me a couple of questions, and if they're spinners, they'll say, how many wheels do you have? How many spinning wheels do you have? Because this may surprise some people, but it is not uncommon for people to have multiple different spinning wheels, or many spinning wheels, or to collect spinning wheels. It, it may also, this may surprise people that spinning wheels are they look simple, yet they can be costly because this isn't something that is uh, mindlessly produced. There's still integrity with spinning wheels and spinning wheel production. So it's not uncommon for people to have uh, multiple wheels, to love their wheels. Their wheels, you know, you'll find your wheels do different things if you want to make different yarns. But for me, I knew this, I narrowed it down to, yes, I, I've done different yarns, but this is really the type of yarn. If I were to pick one yarn that I want to, be, to become an expert at spinning, and to, to be able to one day in my life spin perfectly. It's this type of yarn. And this is the wheel that I, I then need to sit at to do that. And to keep practicing on that and to put those, get those 10,000 plus hours in at mastering the fiber, mastering the wheel, mastering the yarn. We live in a culture that um, values short, brief, impulsive, quick things. That's not what this is. So in some ways, the spinning wheel is a rebellion. I believe maybe you can see that. But it's a rebellion of all that is not to well the world. Not to well for me. Perhaps it's well for somebody else, but not well for me. But 
but then the spinning wheel has been part of revolution in the past. Gandhi was a fan of the spinning wheel. I always thought that was pretty cool. Flatten out a bit. I just realized I forgot to eat to eat breakfast. I was really excited about, about spinning this yarn and carding it. So I should probably once we're done with this. So I can feel on this now when I'm starting to um, pull a bit more of the yarn between my hands and I'm, I'm pulling it myself. That means the wheel is uh, the, the tension in the bottom is not enough to pull it out of my fingers the way I want it to, as quickly as I want it to. So I need to adjust the tension of the bobbin so that it pulls into the bobbin more. Because I want this fiber not for me to have to pull with my hands, but I want the majority of the pulling to be done by the wheel. And so the majority of the work of the pulling is done by the wheel. Just my preference. Sections where it's 100% black, and this is a very beautiful black. Is, um, when you have angora rabbits, the angora rabbit, as it's producing the, the pigment in the, um, the wool, it starts out very dark, heavily pigmented, and then it becomes less as the rabbit grows the wool. It becomes um, a bit more diluted. And it turns gray. So a black and gray rabbit is born growing black wool, and it will always grow black wool in its life. But something that is like a German angora rabbit, the angora rabbit ends up with gray looking wool. And you never get that pure dark uh, black really again on the whole rabbit at once. You really never do. But rabbits that are pluckable. That's a little different. The, they grow the black differently. They, they grow their wool differently. They have a different amount of guard hair as opposed to um, actual horrible fiber. Three more row legs after this. When I start counting, it's because I'm actually getting impatient to, to move on. I get excited to move on to the next to the next piece of the spinning. Which normally I know and I, I keep telling you, I just don't know. I just don't know what to do with this. And that's true. So that's the one that did not escape yet until I had to pick it up. This is very different yarn from when I first started spinning. Um, trying to figure out where to get fiber from, it was very new to me. And so I would look on Craigslist for fiber. And sometimes I would just, I'd, so my first fiber was free Icelandic wool that somebody just gave to me when I was purchasing a rabbit from them. They didn't want it. It was heavily full of vegetable matter. It would have, it would have, and it did take me a lot of time to process up the vegetable matter. And I combined that uh, that wool with angora from my rabbits. And it's hilarious because you think of Icelandic wool. I did not dehair it. 
So it was this coarse hair, Icelandic wool combined with this super soft angora. Just a really different kind of yarn combination, but you know, sometimes that's fun. But I would not likely spin that combination again together. And I wouldn't spin it the way I spun it. I used to drop spindle. And I don't, I just, I don't even own a drop spindle anymore. I just use this wool. And part of it is that the goal, this is going to break. There we go. The goal is to, um, you know, to master this yarn and to master this wheel. To be able to make this yarn with this wheel in an in, in expert way. And so my time, I only had so much time where I could sit down and do this, and so I had to make the choice to pick one tool and to pick this style of yarn. And that's what I just keep working and working and working and working and working on. And sometimes that can be a bit restricting, it can be kind of sad because I don't have the ability to make some of the fine yarns anymore. And you don't certainly have to restrict yourself this way that I have, but there's purpose. And, and the purpose is because the end result is to spin the best 100% Angora yarn, period. And you know, to achieve that, that means spin a lot of Angora. And I use one tool, and I don't often vary. I don't often vary much anymore from what I do. Even though I can, I don't. I used to spin using a lot more unnaturally, like uh, chemically dyed fibers. So you bright colors. So they're not natural. It's not natural to find hot pink. On a rabbit, very, very not natural at all. And so I, I used to spin a lot of bright colored yarns, and I don't anymore because um, one of the things that was an active choice was um, choosing fibers that are naturally colored without having to dye them. And it mattered because the fade, anything that's unnaturally dyed, will will fade more than that which is naturally the animal's natural uh, color of their wool. So if we, whether we dye something, if I use chemicals, the more I wash it, uh, the more I use it, wear it, have it in the sun, that chemically dyed fiber is just going to fade more. Plus it was, you know, making a conscious choice that I don't want to use, I really want to try to avoid using fibers that are chemically dyed because it is not an environmentally friendly process. And you know, we have options. Like instead of having to dye wool black, we have black wool. Just to use that black wool. Instead of having to um, dye brown, dye gray, these are natural colors that we just have. And the cool thing, of course, is there are natural ways to dye yarn. That's a that's certainly a different thing than using the acid dyes, the chemical dyes. And you know, no doubt, my, my children love the, the bright colors of a you know, chemical dye thing. That there's something that that bright color just really screams out and captures attention. Yet what I find is what's always quietly there is the real natural colors. And there's something about them where they don't have to scream. They're just simply there, and their beauty is, they don't have to say a thing. They're just naturally beautiful as they are, which is enjoyable. Uh, 
section to the right of me of a whole bunch of different pieces of debris that are the discarded pizza pieces pizza ah, the discarded pieces of, um, of my spinning I don't like the way this is not joining this one is a little bit difficult here so it was alpaca joined primarily on alpaca. Um, spinning a little bit too tightly. Anytime you spin something with too much twist, you are risking breaking. Uh, breaking the fiber. Which is what happened. It was just, I wasn't getting a good drafting section. I wasn't getting what I wanted. The twist just kept going. Instead of stopping trailing, I kept going until it broke. And then just remove the offending piece and continue on. Two more. Sometimes if you only wash the sheep's wool once, it'll still have a sheepy smell to it. Because the Angora rabbit's not washed, it'll smell like it'll have the Angora rabbit. And the alpaca, it's just been washed once, that's usually okay. Alpacas are, are the least, of all these three fibers, they're like the least scented of all the animals. They're not super scented. Like the sheep obviously has, they have lanolin. Um, that's a pretty strong, it can lead to a pretty strong sheepy smell, especially because this is a male, uh, the male sheep. Even though he's uh, been neutered or either. But there is, if you're interested, there's pictures of that. The sheep who contributed this sheep skull. We have that on our website. He's the only sheep right now that was dignified enough to wear a collar and a belt because the other two are not dignified enough to wear a collar and a belt yet. They're, they're quite young and loony and they just hop around and they're not at all conducting themselves in a respectable manner. If they had collars and bells on them, the only thing you would hear would be the constant ringing of the bells on their collar. Instead, you only, when you open a window or when you go outside, you only hear the occasional respectable walking of rock. Nothing, he's not ridiculous like the other two. But then again, he's older than the other two. However, there is talk of giving the other two a collar. Which is a very big deal, I think, to the sheep. And 
this is not, not pulling it in exactly the way I want, I'm not grabbing as I want. When your bobbin gets full, that happens. It changes um, how it how your bobbin actually is loading up with your yarn. Little thin section there. I don't think that's going to break at all, though. One piece got stuck in my finger and didn't allow a ton of wool through for a brief second. And it made that brief piece of yarn more thin. It's not as much left on my fingers. Itself and make a two-ply yarn. So I will get my ball liner out once it has fitting this. Wind it into a center pull ball. And that's what I'll use to create a two-ply yarn of this row. That's what I'll do with this single. Not a three-ply. Decided against it. So this is going to make a very nice thing, thing yarn. This would actually be a very cute um, bunny doll. I have crochet bunny doll patterns online. There's a free crochet bunny doll patterns online. I think that's for sale, but the free ones, you certainly can download those for free. And um, this yarn would make a great doll because it's just kind of this really enjoyable, energetic variety of colors. Kind of like natural rabbit colors. switch hook so it loads the bobbin more evenly. If we kept it on that hook it would just keep loading very near the end of the bobbin and that's okay when there's a lot of space on the bobbin but when you do not have a lot of space on the bobbin sometimes the spinning wheel the yarn will jump over the bobbin and outside the bobbin that you're loading and when that happens it gets all tangled up everywhere you don't want it to be tangled and um, you can end up with quite a bit of the loss of, of the yarn that you spun if you cannot uh, correct it. And yarn is something, you know, this takes time to spin. You don't often want to. You don't want to have a lot that you've already spun that you then lose. All right, final piece. Final rolling. And the last one. I've been spinning this entire time. Let's see a piece of vegetable matter. Take that up easily. Near the end. Very exciting. This will be very fun to, to uh, knit or crochet with as well. Very entertaining. 
So by applying it back on itself, on itself doing a two-ply, which is what I will do with this, it's going to add a bit more, even more variety to your colors. So you're going to find maybe some sections will be um, just white, but then they'll have all of them. Uh, you know, it, it just applying is twisting the yarn back on it. A two-ply using a center ball is twisting the yarn back on itself. Um, and so you end up with two strands of yarn twisted around each other. So that is what this will actually be kind of a, a bolder, heathered type look through this in its own artistic way. Drafting, when I get to drafting the sheep's well, it, it doesn't draft as quickly as the Angora does. And of course, the alpaca is kind of in the middle of the two. It drafts faster than the sheep's well, but slower than the Angora. No surprise there. Thank you. 
here, the last couple of bits are going to really just uh, pin sheet wool and don't pack them. There's only a teeny bit of white and gold. That was actually a second cut that I just picked up. So this yarn, this single, will end up with uh, sheet wool the packer as the final and the fibers. And you never know when you have a mixture of fibers like this what, what it's going to end up with. So that's where we're going to end the video right now. And thank you guys for participating, for being a part of the chat, being a part of the conversation, for spending this time with me, spinning this yarn. Hopefully if you're spinning, you're having an excellent day. And we will stop this here and we'll move on. Thank you.